The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy by Douglas Adams The podcast versions of the original Facebook Live readings during the coronavirus outbreak by Matthew Ogden, The Bearded Wit. Please bear in mind that as Facebook Live recordings, these are rough and ready, there are mistakes, there are a few trip-ups here and there, and there is laughter from the reader as he goes through and follows the humour himself along with you, the listener. We hope you enjoy listening to these and share liberally. Part 4 Chapter 17 After a fairly shaky start to the day, Arthur's mind was beginning to reassemble itself from the shell-shocked fragments the previous day had left him with. He had found a neutromatic machine which had provided him with a plastic cup filled with a liquid that was almost, but not quite, entirely unlike tea. The way it functioned was very interesting. When the drink button was pressed, it made an instant but highly detailed examination of the subject's taste buds, a spectroscopic analysis of the subject's metabolism, and then sent tiny experimental signals down the neural pathways to the taste centres of the subject's brain to see what it was what was likely to go down well. However, no one quite knew why it did this, because it invariably dis- delivered a cupful of liquid that was almost, but not quite entirely, unlike tea. The Nutrimatic was designed and manufactured by the Sirius Cybernetics Corporation, whose complaints department now covers all of the major land masses of the first three planets of the Sirius Tau star system. Arthur drank the liquid and found it reviving. He glanced up at the screens again and watched a few more hundred miles of barren greyness slide past. It suddenly occurred to him to ask a question which had been bothering him. Is it safe? he said. Magrathea's been dead for five million years, said Zaphod. Of course it's safe. Even the ghosts will have settled down and raised families by now. At which point, a strange and inexplicable sound thrilled suddenly through the bridge. A noise as of a distant fanfare, a hollow, reedy, insubstantial sound. It preceded a voice that was equally hollow, reedy, and insubstantial. The voice said, Greetings to you. Someone from the dead planet was talking to them. Computer, shouted Zaphod. Hi there! What the photon is it? Ah, just some five million year old tape that's been broadcast at us. A what? A a recording? Shush, said Ford. It's carrying on. The voice was old, courteous, almost charming, but was underscored with a quite unmistakable menace. Uh, This is a recorded announcement, it said. As I'm afraid we're all out at the moment. The Commercial Council of Magrathia thanks you for your esteemed visit. A voice from ancient Magrathea, shouted Zaphod. Okay, okay, said Ford. Shush! But regrets, continued the voice, that the entire planet is temporarily closed for business. Thank you. If you would care to leave your name and the address of a planet where you can be contacted, kindly speak when you hear the tone. A short buzz followed, and then silence. They want to get rid of us, said Trillian nervously. What do we do? Ah, It's just a recording, said Zaphod. We keep going. Got that computer? I got it, the computer said, and gave the ship an extra kick of speed. They waited. After a second or so came the fanfare once again, and then the voice. We would like to assure you that as soon as our business is resumed, 
announcements will be made in all fashionable magazines and colour supplements, when our clients will once again be able to select from all that's best in contemporary geography. The menace in the voice took on a sharper edge. Meanwhile, we thank our clients for their kind interest and would ask them to leave. Now. Arthur looked around the nervous faces of his companions. Well, I suppose we'd better get going then, hadn't we? He suggested. Shh, said Zaphod. There's absolutely nothing to be worried about. Then why is everyone so tense? They're just interested, shouted Zaphod. Computer, start a descent into the atmosphere and prepare for landing. This time, the fanfare was quite perfunctory, the voice now distinctly cold. It is most gratifying, it said, that your enthusiasm for our planet continues unabated, and so we would like to assure you that the guided missiles currently converging with your ship are part of a special service we extend to all of our most enthusiastic clients, and that the fully armed nuclear warheads are, of course, merely a courtesy detail. We look forward to your custom in future lives. Thank you. The voice snapped off. Oh, said Trillian. Huh? said Arthur. Well, said Ford. Look, said Zaphod, will you get it into your heads? That's just a recorded message. It's millions of years old. It doesn't apply to us. Get it? What, said Trillian quietly, about the missiles? Missiles don't make me laugh. Ford tapped Zaphod on the shoulder and pointed at the rear screen. Clear in the distance behind them, two silver darts were climbing through the atmosphere towards the ship. A quick change of magnification brought them into close focus. Two massively real rockets thundering through the sky. The suddenness of it was shocking. I think they're going to have a very good try at applying to us, said Ford. Zaphod stared at them in astonishment. Hey, this is terrific, he said. Someone down there is trying to kill us. Terrific, said Arthur. But don't you see what this means? Yes, we're going to die. Yes, but apart from that, apart from that, it means we must be on to something. How soon can we get off it? Second by second, the image of the missiles on the screen grew larger. They'd swung round now onto a direct homing course, so that all that could be seen of them now was the warheads, head on. As a matter of interest, said Trillian, what are we going to do? Just keep cool, said Zaphod. Is that all? shouted Arthur. No, uh, we're also going to uh, uh, take evasive action, said Zaphod, with a sudden access of panic. Computer, what evasive action can we take? Uh, None, I'm afraid, guys, said the computer. Or something, said Zaphod. Uh, He said. There seems to be something jamming my guidance systems, explained the computer brightly. Impact minus 45 seconds. Please call me Eddie if it'll help you relax. Zaphod tried to run several equally decisive directions simultaneously. Uh, right! Uh, ah, uh, we've got to get manual control of this ship! Can you fly her? asked Ford pleasantly. No. Can you? No. Trillian, can you? No. Fine, said Zaphod, relaxing. We'll do it together. I can't either, said Arthur, who felt it was time he began to assert himself. I guess that, said Zaphod. OK, computer, full manual control, now! You got it, said the computer. Several large desk panels slid open, and banks of control consoles sprang up out of them, showering the crew with bits of expanded polystyrene packaging and balls of rolled-up cellophane. These controls had never been used before. Zaphod stared at them wildly. OK, Ford, he said. Full retro thrust, ten degrees starboard. Or something. Good luck, guys, chirped the computer. 
Impact minus 30 seconds. Ford leapt to the controls. Only a few of them made any immediate sense to him, so he pulled those. The ship shook and screamed as its guidance rocket jets tried to push it every which way simultaneously. He released half of them, and the ship spun around in a tight arc and headed back the way it had come, straight towards the oncoming missiles. Air cushions ballooned out of the walls in an instant as everyone was thrown against them. For a few seconds, the inertial forces held them flattened and squirming for breath, unable to move. Zaphod struggled and pushed in manic desperation and finally managed a savage kick at a small lever that formed part of the guidance system. The lever snapped off. The ship twisted sharply and rocketed upwards. The crew were hurled violently back across the cabin. Ford's copy of The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy smashed into another section of the control console, with the combined result that the guide started to explain to anyone who cared to listen about the best ways of smuggling Antarian parakeet glands out of Antares. An Antarian parakeet gland stuck on a small stick is a revolting but much sought-after cocktail delicacy and very large sums of money are often paid for them by very rich idiots who would want to impress who want to impress other very rich idiots and the ship suddenly dropped out of the sky like a stone it was of course more or less at this moment that one of the crew sustained a nasty bruise to the upper arm this shouldn't be emphasised because, as has already been revealed, they escape otherwise completely unharmed, and the deadly nuclear missiles do not eventually hit the ship. The safety of the crew is absolutely assured. Impact minus 20 seconds, guys, said the computer. Then turn the bloody engines back on, bawled Zaphod. Oh, sure thing, guys, said the computer. With a subtle roar, the engines cut back in. The ship smoothly flattened out of its dive and headed back towards the missiles again. The computer began to sing. When you walk through the storm, it whined nasally. Hold your head up high. Zaphod screamed at it to shut up, but his voice was lost in the din of what they quite naturally assumed was approaching destruction. And don't be afraid of the dark, Eddie wailed. The ship, in flattening out, had in fact flattened out upside down. And lying on the ceiling as they were, it was now totally impossible for any of the crew to reach any of the guidance systems. At the end of the storm, crooned Eddie. The two missiles loomed massively on the screens as they thundered towards the ship. Is a golden sky. But by an extraordinarily lucky chance, they had not yet fully corrected their flight paths to that of the erratically weaving ship, and they passed right underneath it. And the sweet hill song of the lark. Revised impact time, 15 seconds, fellas. Walk on! And the missiles banked round in a screeching arc and plunged back in pursuit. This is it, said Arthur, watching them. We are now quite definitely going to die, aren't we? I wish you'd stop saying that, shouted Ford. Well, we are, aren't we? Yes! Walk on through the rain, sang Eddie. A thought struck Arthur. He struggled to his feet. Why doesn't anyone turn on this improbability drive thing? He said. We, we could probably reach that. What? Are you crazy? said Zaphod. Without proper programming, anything could happen. Does that matter at this stage? shouted Arthur. No, your dreams be tossed and blown, sang Eddie. Arthur scrambled up onto one of the excitingly chunky pieces of moulded contouring, where the curve of the wall met the ceiling. Walk on, walk on, 
With home in your heart. Does anyone know why Arthur can't turn on the improbability drive? Shouted Trillian. And you'll never in, impact minus five seconds. It's been great knowing you guys. God bless. You'll never. I said, yelled Trillian. Does anyone know? The next thing that happened was a mind mangling explosion of noise and light. And the next thing that happened after that was that the Heart of Gold continued on its way perfectly normally, with a rather fetchingly redesigned interior. It was somewhat larger and done out in delicate pastel shades of green and blue. In the centre of a spiral staircase, leading nowhere in particular, stood a spray of ferns and yellow flowers next to, and next to it a stone sundial pedestal housed the main computer terminal. Cunningly deployed lighting and mirrors created the illusion of standing in a conservatory overlooking a wide stretch of exquisitely manicured garden. Around the periphery of the conservatory area stood marble-topped tables on intricately beautiful wrought iron legs. As you gazed into the polished surface of the marble, the vague forms of instruments became visible, and as you touched them, the instruments materialised instantly under your hands. Looked at from the correct angles, the mirrors appeared to reflect all the required data readouts, though it was far from clear where they were reflected from. It was, in fact, sensationally beautiful. Relaxing in a wickerwork, wickerwork sun chair, Zaphod Beeblebrock said, What the hell happened? Well, I, I was just saying, said Arthur, lounging by a small fish pool, there's this uh, improbability, uh, improbability drive switch over here. He, where, he waved at where it had been. There was a potted plant there now. But uh, where, where are we? said Ford, who was sitting on the spiral staircase, a nicely chinned pangalactic gargle blaster in his hand. Exactly where we were, I think, said Trillian, as all about them the mirrors suddenly showed them an image of the blighted landscape of Magrathea, which still scooted along beneath them. Zaphod leapt out of his seat. Then what's what's happened to the missiles? he said. A new and astounding image appeared in the mirrors. They would appear said Ford doubtfully, to have turned into a bowl of petunias and a very surprised-looking whale. At an improbability factor, cut in Eddie, who hadn't changed a bit, of 8,767,128 to 1 against. Zaphod stared at Arthur. Did you think of that, Earthman? he demanded. Well, said Arthur, all I did was, that's very good thinking, you know. Turn on the improbability drive for a second without first activating the proofing screens. Hey, kid, you just saved our lives, you know that? Oh, said Arthur, well, well it was nothing, really. Was it? said Zaphod. Oh, well, forget it then. Okay, computer, take us in on to land. But I said forget it. Another thing that got forgotten was the fact that, against all probability, a sperm whale had suddenly been called into existence several miles above the surface of an alien planet. And since this was not a naturally tenable position for a whale, this poor innocent creature had very little time to come to terms with its identity as a whale before it then had to come to terms with not being a whale any more. This is a complete record of its thought from the moment it began its life until the moment it ended it. Ah, what's happening? it thought. Uh, excuse me, who am I? Hello? Why am I here? What's my purpose in life? What do I mean by who am I? Get, get, calm down, get, get a grip now, get a grip. Ooh, ooh, this is an interesting sensation. 
What is it? It's a, it's a sort of yawning, tingling sensation in my, in my, well, I, I suppose I better start finding names for things if I want to make any headway in what, for the sake of what I shall call for an argument, uh, well, the world. So, um, let's call it my stomach. Good. Ooh, it's getting quite strong. And hey, what about this whistling, roaring sound going past what I'm suddenly going to call my head? Perhaps I can call that ooh, wind. Is that a good? Yeah, it'll do. Wind. Perhaps I can find a better name for it later when I found out what it's for. It must be something very important because there certainly seems to be a hell of a lot of it. Hey, what's this thing? This? Ooh, let's call it a tail. Yeah, tail. Hey, hey, I can really thrash it about pretty good, can't I? Wow, wow. That feels great. Doesn't seem to achieve very much, but I'll probably find out what it's for later on. Now, have I built up any any kind of coherent picture of things yet? No? Oh, never mind. Hey, this is really exciting. So much to find out about. So much to look forward to. I'm quite dizzy with anticipation. Or is it the wind? There really is a lot of that now, isn't there? Oh, wow. Hey, hey, what's this thing suddenly coming towards me very fast? Very, very fast. <gasps> so big and flat and round. It needs a big, wide sounding name like, ooh, down, down, round, ground. <laughs> That's it. That's a good name. Ground. I wonder if it'll be friends with me. And the rest, after a sudden wet thud was silence. Curiously enough, the only thing that went through the mind of the bowl of petunias as it fell was, oh no, not again. Many people have speculated that if we knew exactly why the bowl of petunias had that thought, we would know a lot more about the nature of the universe than we do now. Are we taking this robot with us, said Ford, looking with distaste at Marvin, who was standing in an awkward hunched posture in the corner under a small palm tree. Zayford glanced away from the mirror screens which presented a panoramic view of the blighted landscape upon which the Heart of Gold had now landed. Oh, the paranoid android, he said. Yeah, yeah, we'll take him. But what are you supposed to do with a manically depressed robot? You think you've got problems, said Marvin, as if he was addressing a newly occupied coffin. What are you supposed to do if you are a manically depressed robot? No, don't bother to answer that. I'm 50,000 times more intelligent than you, and even I don't know the answer. It gives me a headache just trying to think down to your level. Trillian burst in through the door from her cabin. My white mice have escaped, she said. An expression of deep worry and concern failed to cross either of Zaphod's faces. Nuts to your white mice, he said. Trillian glared an upset glare at him and disappeared again. It is possible that her remark would have commanded greater attention had it been generally, generally realised that human beings were only the third most intelligent life form present on the planet Earth, instead of, as was generally thought by most independent observers, the second. Good afternoon, boys. The voice was oddly familiar, but oddly different. It had a matriarchal twang. It announced itself to the crew as they arrived at the airlock hatchway that would let them out onto the planet's surface. They looked at each other in puzzlement. It's uh, the computer, explained Zaphod. I discovered it had an emergency backup personality they thought might work better. Now, this is going to be your first day out on a strange new planet continued Eddie's new voice. So, I want you all wrapped up, snug and warm, and no playing with any naughty bug-eyed monsters. Zaphod tapped impatiently on the hatch. I'm sorry, he said. I think we might be better off with a slide rule. Right, snapped the computer. Who said that? Will you open up the exit hatch, please, computer, said Zaphod, trying not to get angry. Not until whoever said that owns up, urged the computer, stamping a few synapses closed. Oh, God, 
muttered Ford. He slumped against a bulkhead and started to count to ten. He was desperately worried that one day sentient life forms would forget how to do this. Only by counting could humans demonstrate their independence of computers. Come on, said Eddie sternly. Computer, began Zaphod. I'm waiting, interrupted Eddie. I can wait all day if necessary. Computer, said Zaphod again, who had been trying to think of some subtle piece of reasoning to put, uh, put the computer down with, and had decided not to bother competing with it on its own ground. If you don't open that exit hatch this moment, I shall zap straight off to your major data banks and reprogram you with a very large X. Got that? Eddie, shocked, paused, considered this. Ford carried on counting quietly. This is about the most aggressive thing you can do to a computer. It's the equivalent of going up to a human being and saying, Blood, 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 blood. Finally, Eddie said quietly, I can see this relationship is something we're all going to have to work at. And the hatchway opened. An icy wind ripped into them. They hugged themselves warmly and stepped down the ramp onto the barren dust of Magrathea. It'll all end in tears, I know it, shouted Eddie after them, and closed the hatchway again. A few minutes later, he opened and closed the hatchway again, in response to a command that caught him entirely by surprise. Morty. Oh, just in my bottom position as well. Twenty. Five figures wandered slowly over the blighted land. Bits of it were dullish grey, bits of it dullish brown. The rest of it rather less interesting to look at. It was like a dried-out marsh, now barren of all vegetation, and covered with a layer of dust about an inch thick. It was very cold. Zaphod was clearly rather depressed about it. He stalked off by himself and was soon lost to sight behind a slight rise in the ground. The wind stung Arthur's eyes and ears, and the stale, thin air clasped his throat. However, the thing that stung most was his mind. It's fantastic, he said, and his own voice rattled in his ears. Sound carried badly in this thin atmosphere. Desolate hole, if you ask me, said Ford. I could have more fun in a cat litter. He felt a mounting irritation. Of all the planets in all the star systems of all the galaxy, many wild and exotic seething with life, didn't he just have to turn up at a dump like this after fifteen years of being a castaway? Not even a hot dog stand in evidence. He stooped down and picked up a cold clod of earth, but there was nothing underneath it worth crossing thousands of light years to look at. No, 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 no insisted Arthur. You don't understand. This is the first time I've actually stood on the planet of another planet, on the, on the surface of another planet. A whole alien world. Pity it's such a dump, though. Trillian hugged herself, shivered, and frowned. She could have sworn she saw a slight and unexpected movement out of the corner of her eye, but when she glanced in that direction, all she could see was the ship, still and silent, a hundred yards or so behind them. She was relieved when a second or so later they caught sight of Zaphod standing on top of a ridge of ground and waving to them to come and join him. He seemed to be excited, but they couldn't clearly hear what it was he was saying because of the thinnish atmosphere and the wind. As they approached the ridge of higher ground, they became aware that it seemed to be circular, a crater about a 150 yards wide. Round the outside of the crater, the sloping ground was splattered with black and red lumps. They stopped and looked at a piece. It was wet. It was rubbery. With horror, they suddenly realised that it was fresh whale meat. 
At the top of the crater's lip, they met Zaphod. Look, he said, pointing into the crater. At the centre of the exploded carcass of a lowly sperm whale that hadn't lived long enough to be disappointed with its lot, the silence was only disturbed by the slight involuntary spasms of Trillian's throat. I suppose there's no point in uh, trying to bury it, murmured Arthur, and then wished he hadn't. Come, said Zaphod, and started back down into the crater. Wait, down there, said Trillian, with severe distaste. Yeah, said Zaphod. Come on, I've got something to show you. We can see it. Not that, said Zaphod. Something else. Come on. They all hesitated. Come on, insisted Zaphod. I found a way in. In? said Arthur in horror. Into the interior of the planet. An underground passage. The force of the whale's impact cracked it open. And that's where we have to go. Where no man has trod these five million years. Into the very depths of time itself. Marvin started his ironical humming again. Zaphod hit him and he shut up. With little shudders of disgust, they all followed Zaphod down the incline into the crater, trying very hard to avoid looking at its unfortunate creator. Life, said Marvin dolefully. Loathe it or ignore it. You can't like it. The ground had caved in where the whale had hit, revealing a network of galleries and passages, now largely obstructed by collapsed rubble and entrails. Zaphod had made a start clearing a way into one of them, but Marvin was able to do it rather faster. Dank air wafted out of its dark recesses, and as Zaphod shone a torch into it, little was visible in the dusty gloom. According to the legends, he said, the Magrathians lived most of their lives underground. Why is that? said Arthur. Did the surface become too polluted or overpopulated? No, I don't think so, said Zaphod. I think they just didn't like it very much. Are you sure you know what you're doing? said Trillian, peering nervously into the darkness. Uh, we've been attacked once already, you know. Look, kid, I promise you, the live population of this planet is nil plus the four of us. So come on, let's get in there. Hey, uh, uh Earthman. Arthur, said Arthur. Yeah, uh, could you just sort of keep this robot with you and guard this end of the passageway, okay? Guard, said Arthur. What from? You just said there's no one here. Yeah, well, just for safety, okay? Said Zaphod. Whose? Yours or mine? Good lad. Okay, here we go. Zaphod scrambled down into the passage, followed by Trillian and Ford. Well, I hope you all have a really miserable time, complained Arthur. Don't worry, Marvin assured him. They will. In a few seconds, they had disappeared from view. Arthur stamped around in a huff and then decided that a whale's graveyard is not, on the whole, a good place to stamp around in. Marvin eyed him balefully for a moment and then turned himself off. Zaphod marched quickly down the passageway, nervous as hell, but trying to hide it by striding purposefully. He flung the torch beam around. The walls were covered in dark tiles and were cold to the touch. The air thick with decay. There, what did I tell you, he said, an, in, an inhabited planet, Magrathea. And he strode on through the dirt and debris that littered the tile floors. Trillian was reminded unavoidably of the London Underground, though it was less thoroughly squalid. At, inter at intervals along the walls, the tiles gave way to large mosaics, simple angular patterns in bright colours. Trillian stopped and coloured uh, uh, sorry, Trillian stopped and studied one of them, but could not interpret any sense in them. She called to Zaphod. Hey, have you any idea what these strange symbols are? 
Uh, I think they're just uh, strange symbols of some kind, said Zaphod, hardly glancing back. Trillian shrugged and hurried after him. From time to time a doorway led either to the left or right into smallish chambers, which Ford discovered to be full of derelict computer equipment. He dragged Zaphod into one to have a look, and Trillian followed. Look, said Ford, you reckon this is Magrathea? Yeah, said Zaphod, and we heard the voice, right? OK, so I've bought the fact that it's Magrathea for the moment. What you have so far, what you've so far said nothing about, is how in the galaxy you found it. You didn't just look it up in a star atlas, that's for sure. Research, government archives, detective work, a few lucky guesses, easy. And then you stole the heart of gold to come and look for it with. I stole it to look for a lot of things. A lot of things? said Ford in surprise. Like what? I don't know. What? I don't know what I'm looking for. Why not? Because, because, I think it might be because I, if I knew, I wouldn't be able to look for them. Well, are you crazy? It's a possibility I haven't ruled out just yet, said Zaford quietly. I only know as much about myself as my mind can work out under its current conditions, and its current conditions are not good. For a time, nobody said anything as Ford gazed at Zaphod with a mind suddenly full of worry. Listen, uh, old friend, if you want to, started Ford eventually. No, no, wait, I'll tell you something, said Zaphod. I free wheel a lot. I get an idea to do something, and hey, why not I do it? I reckon I'll become president of the galaxy, and it just happens. It's easy. I decide to steal the ship. I decide to look for Macrothea, and it all just happens. Yeah, I work out how it can be best done, right, but it always works out. It's like having a galactic credit card, which keeps on working, even though you never send off the checks. And then when I stop and think, why did I want to do something? How did I work out how to do it? I get a very strong desire to just stop thinking about it. Like I have now. It's a big effort to talk about it. Zaphod paused for a while. For a while, there was silence. Then he frowned and said, Last night I was worrying about this again, about the fact that part of my mind just didn't seem to work properly. Then it occurred to me that the way it seemed was that someone else was using my mind to have good ideas with without telling me about it. I put the two ideas together and decided that maybe somebody had locked off part of my mind for that purpose, which is why I couldn't use it. I wondered if there was a way I could check. I went to the ship's medibay and plugged myself into the encephalographic screen. I went through every major screening test on both my heads, all the tests I had to go through under government medical officers before my nomination for the presidency could be properly ratified. They showed up nothing. Nothing unexpected, at least. They showed that I was clever, imaginative, irresponsible, untrustworthy, extrovert, nothing you couldn't have guessed, and no other anomalies. So I started inventing further tests, completely at random. Nothing. And then I tried superimposing the results from one head on top of the results from the other head. Still nothing. Finally, I got silly because I'd given it all up as nothing more than an attack of paranoia. Last thing I did before I packed it in was to take a superimposed picture and look at it through a green filter. You remember I was always superstitious about the color green when I was a kid? I always wanted to be a pilot on one of the trading scouts. Ford nodded. And there it was, said Zaphod, clear as day. A whole section in the middle of both brains that related only to each other and not to anything else around them. Some bastard had cauterized all the synapses and electronically traumatized those two lumps of cerebellum. Ford stared at him aghast. Trillian had turned white. Somebody did that to you, whispered Ford. Yeah. 
but have you got any idea who or, or why? Why, I can only guess, but I do know who the bastard was. You know? But, but how do you know? Because they left their initials burnt into the cauterized synapses. They left them there for me to see. Ford stared at him in horror and felt his skin begin to crawl. Initials burnt into your brain? Yeah. Well, what were they, for God's sake? Zaphod looked at him in silence, and then he looked away. Z.B., he said quietly. At that moment, a steel shutter slammed down behind them, and gas started to pour into the chamber. I'll tell you about it later, choked Zaphod, as all three of them passed out. On the surface of Magrathea, Arthur wandered about moodily. Ford had thoughtfully left him his copy of The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy to while away the time with. He pushed a few buttons at random. The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy is a very unevenly edited book and contains many passages that simply seemed to its editors like a good idea at the time. One of them, the one Arthur now came across, supposedly relates to the experiences of one Viet Vujigig, a quiet young student at the University of Maxi Megalon, who pursued a brilliant academic career studying ancient philology, transformational ethics, and the wave harmonic theory of historical perception. And then, after a night of drinking pangalactic gargle blasters with Zaphod Beeblebrox, became increasingly obsessed with the problem of what had happened to all the biros he'd bought over the past few years. There followed a long period of painstaking research, during which he visited all the major centres of biro loss throughout the galaxy, and eventually came up with a quaint little theory which quite caught the public ima imagination at the time. Somewhere in the cosmos, he said, along with all the planets inhabited by humanoids, reptiloids, fishoids, walking treoids, and superintelligent shades of the colour blue, there was also a planet entirely given over to biro life forms. And it was to this planet that unattended biros would make their way, slipping away quietly through wormholes in space to a world where they knew they could enjoy a uniquely biroid lifestyle responding to highly biro oriented or orientated stimuli and generally leading the biro equivalent of the good life and as theories go this was all very fine and pleasant until Viet Vujigig suddenly claimed to have found this planet and to have worked there for a while driving a limousine for a family of cheap green retractables whereupon he was taken away locked up wrote a book and was finally sent into tax exile, which is the usual fate reserved for those who are determined to make a fool of themselves in public. When one day an expedition was sent to the spatial coordinates that Vujigig had claimed for this planet, they discovered only a small asteroid inhabited by a solitary old man who claimed repeatedly that nothing was true, though he was later discovered to be lying. There did, however, remain the question of both the mysterious 60,000 Altarian dollars paid yearly into his Brantisvogan bank account, and of course Zaphod Beeblebrock's highly profitable second-hand biro business. Arthur read this and put the book down. The robot still sat there, completely inert. Arthur got up and walked to the top of the crater. He walked around the crater. He watched two suns set magnificently over Magrathea. He went back into the crater. He woke up the robot because even a manically depressed robot is better to talk to than nobody. Night's falling, he said. Look, robot, the stars are coming out. From the heart of a dark nebula, it is possible to see very few stars, and only very faintly but they were there to be seen. The robot obediently looked at them, then looked back. I know, he said. Wretched, isn't it? 
But that sunset, I've never seen anything like it in my wildest dreams. The two suns, it was like, it was like mountains of fire boiling into space. I've seen it, said Marvin. It's rubbish. We only ever had the one sun at home, persevered Arthur. I came from a planet called Earth, you know. I know, said Marvin. You keep going on about it. It sounds awful. Oh, no, it was a beautiful place. Did it have oceans? Oh, yes, said Arthur with a sigh. Great, wide, rolling blue oceans. Can't bear oceans, said Marvin. Tell me, inquired Arthur, do you get on well with other robots? Hate them, said Marvin. Where are you going? Arthur couldn't bear any more. He'd got up again. I think I'll just uh, take another walk, he said. Don't blame you, said Marvin, and counted 597,000 million sheep before falling asleep again a second later. Arthur slapped his arms about him to try and get his circulation a little more enthusiastic about its job. He trudged back up the wall of the crater. Because the atmosphere was so thin, and because there was no moon, nightfall was very rapid, and it was, by now, very dark. Because of this, Arthur practically walked into the old man before he noticed him. Morty. Cold tea. <clears throat> he, the old man, was standing with his back to Arthur, watching the very last glimmers of light sink into blackness behind the horizon. He was tallish, elderly, and dressed in a single long grey robe. When he turned his face when he turned, his face was thin and distinguished, careworn but not unkind, the sort of face you would happily bank with. But he didn't turn yet, not even to react to Arthur's yelp of surprise. Eventually the last rays of the sun had vanished completely, and then he turned. His face was still illuminated from somewhere, and when Arthur looked for the source of the light, he saw that a few yards away stood a small craft of some kind, a small hovercraft, Arthur guessed. It shed a dim pool of light around it. The man looked at Arthur, sadly, it seemed. You chose a cold night to visit our dead planet, he said. Uh, who are you? stammered Arthur. The man looked away. Again a look of sadness seemed to cross his face. My name is not important, he said. He seemed to have something on his mind. Conversation was clearly something he felt he didn't have to rush at. Arthur felt awkward. I, um, you, you startled me, he said lamely. The man looked round to him again and slightly raised his eyebrows. Hmm? he said. I said you startled me. Do not be alarmed. I will not harm you. Arthur frowned at him. But you shot at us. There were missiles, he said. The man gazed into the pit of the crater. The slight glow from Marvin's eyes cast very faint red shadows on the huge carcass of the whale. The man chuckled slightly. <laughs> An automatic system, he said, and then gave a small sigh. <sighs> Ancient computers ranged in the bowels of the planet tick away the dark millennia, and the ages hang heavily on their dusty data banks. I, I think they take the occasional pot shot to relieve the monotony. He looked gravely at Arthur and said, I'm a great fan of science, you know. Oh, uh, really? 
said Arthur, who was beginning to find the man's curious, kindly manner disconcerting. Oh, yes, said the old man, and simply stopped talking again. Ah, said Arthur, er, uh. He had an odd feeling of being like a man in the act of adultery who is surprised when the woman's husband wanders into the room, changes his trousers, passes a few idle remarks about the weather, and leaves again. "'You seem ill at ease,' said the old man, with polite concern. "'Uh, no, well, y yes. Uh, actually, we weren't really expecting to find anybody about, in fact. I sort of gathered that you were all dead or, or, or something.' "'Dead?' said the old man. "'Goodness gracious me, no. We have but slept.' "'Slept?' said Arthur incredulously. "'Yes, through the economic recession, you see,' said the old man, apparently unconcerned about whether Arthur Dent understood a word of what he was talking about or not. Arthur had to prompt him again. "'Um, economic uh, recession?' "'Well, uh, you see, five million years ago the galactic economy collapsed.' And seeing that custom-built planets are something of a luxury commodity, you see... He paused and looked at Arthur. You know we built planets, do you? he asked solemnly. Well, yes, said Arthur. I, I, I sort of gathered that. Fascinating trade, said the old man, and a wistful look came into his eyes. <sighs> Doing the coastlines was always my favourite. Used to have endless fun doing the little bits in fjords. So, anyway, he said, trying to find his thread again, the recession came, and, and we decided it would save a lot of bother if we just uh, slept through it. So we programmed the computers to revive us when it was all over. The man stifled a very slight yawn and continued. The computers uh, were indexed linked to the galactic stock market prices, you see. So we'd all be revived when everybody else had rebuilt the economy enough to afford our rather expensive services. Arthur, a regular Guardian reader, was deeply shocked at this. That's a pretty unpleasant way to behave, isn't it? It is, asked the old man mildly. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm a bit out of touch. He pointed down into the crater. Is that robot yours? he said. No, came a thin metallic voice from the crater. I'm mine. If you'd call it a robot, muttered Arthur, it's more of a sort of electronic sulking machine. Bring it, said the old man. Arthur was quite surprised to hear a note of decision suddenly present in the old man's voice. He called to Marvin, who crawled up the slope, making a big show of being lame, which he wasn't. On second thoughts, said the old man, leave it here. You must come with me. Great things are afoot. He turned towards his craft, which, though no apparent signal had been given, now drifted quietly towards them through the dark. Arthur looked down at Marvin, who now made an equally big show of turning round laboriously and trudging off down into the crater again, muttering sour nothings to himself. "'Come,' said the old man. "'Come now, or you will be late.' "'Late?' said Arthur. What for? What is your name, human? Dent, Arthur Dent, said Arthur. Late, as in the late Dent Arthur Dent, said the old man sternly. It's a sort of threat, you see. Another wistful thought, look, came into his tired old eyes. I've never been very good at them myself, but I'm told they can be very effective. Arthur blinked at him. "'What an extraordinary person!' he muttered to himself. "'I beg your pardon?' said the old man. "'Oh, nothing. I I'm sorry,' said Arthur, in embarrassment. 
All right, where do we go? In my air car, said the man, motioning Arthur to get into the craft, which had settled silently next to them. We are going deep into the bowels of the planet, where even now our race is being revived from its five million year slumber. Magrathea awakes. Arthur shivered involuntary, involuntarily as he seated himself next to the old man. The strangeness of it, the silent bobbing movement of the craft as it soared into the night sky quite unsettled him. He looked at the old man, his face illuminated by the dull glow of tiny lights on the instrument panel. Um, excuse me, he said to me. What is your name, by the way? My name? said the old man, and the same distant sadness came into his face again. He paused. My name, he said, is Slarty Bartfast. Arthur practically choked. I, I beg your pardon, he spluttered. Slarty Bartfast, repeated the old man quietly. Slarty Bartfast? The old man looked at him gravely. I said it wasn't important, he said. The air car sailed through the night. It is an important and popular fact that things are not always what they seem. For instance, on the planet Earth, man had always assumed that he was more intelligent than dolphins because he had achieved so much. The wheel, New York, wars, and so on, whilst all the dolphins had ever done was muck about in the water having a good time. But, conversely, the dolphins had always believed that they were far more intelligent than man for, pre for precisely the same reasons. Curiously enough, the dolphins had long known of the impending destruction of the planet Earth and had made many attempts to alert mankind to the danger. But most of their communications were misinterpreted as amusing attempts to punch footballs or whistle for tidbits, so they eventually gave up and left the Earth by their own means shortly before the Vogons arrived. The last ever dolphin message was misinterpreted as a surprisingly sophisticated attempt to do a double backwards somersault through a hoop whilst whistling the Star Spangled Banner. But in fact, the message was this. So long, and thanks for all the fish. In fact, there was only one species on the planet more intelligent than dolphins, and they spent a lot of their time in behavioural research laboratories, running around inside wheels, and conducting frighteningly elegant and subtle experiments on man. The fact that, once again, man completely misinterpreted this relationship was entirely according to these creatures' plans. Silently, the air car coasted through the cold darkness. A single soft glow of light that was utterly alone in the deep Magrathian night. It sped swiftly. Arthur's companion seemed sunk in his own thoughts, and when Arthur tried on a couple of occasions to engage him in conversation again, he would simply reply by asking if he was comfortable enough, and then left it at that. Arthur tried to gauge the speed at which they were travelling, but the blackness outside was absolute, and he was denied any reference points. The sense of motion was so soft and slight, he could almost believe they were hardly moving at all. When a tiny glow of light appeared in the far distance, and within seconds had grown so much in size that Arthur realised it was travelling towards them at colossal speed, and he tried to make out what sort of craft it might be. He peered at it, but was unable to discern any clear shape, and suddenly gasped in alarm as the air car dipped sharply and headed downwards in what seemed to be a certain collision course. Their relative velocity seemed unbelievable, and Arthur hardly had time to draw breath before it was all over. The next thing he was aware of was an insane silver blur that seemed to surround him. 
It twisted his head sharply round. Sorry, he twisted his head sharply round and saw a small black point dwindling rapidly in the distance behind them. And it took him several seconds to realize what had just happened. They had plunged into a tunnel in the ground. The colossal speed had been their own relative to the glow of light, which was a stationary hole in the ground, the mouth of the tunnel. The insane blur of silver was the circular wall of the tunnel down which they were shooting, apparently at several hundred miles an hour. He closed his eyes in terror. After a length of time, which he made no attempt to judge, he sensed a slight subsidence in their speed, and some while later became aware that they were gradually gliding to a gentle halt. He opened his eyes again. They were still in the silver tunnel, threading and weaving their way through what appeared to be a criss-cross warren of converging tunnels. When they finally stopped, it was in a chamber of curved steel. Several tunnels also had their terminus here, and at the farther end of the chamber, Arthur could see a large circle of dim, irritating light. It was irritating because it played tricks with the eyes. It was impossible to focus on it properly or tell how near or far it was. Arthur guessed, quite wrongly, that it might be ultraviolet. Slarty Bartfast turned and regarded Arthur with his solemn old eyes. Earthman, he said, we are now deep in the heart of Magrathea. How did you know I was an Earthman? demanded Arthur. These things will become clear to you, said the old man gently. At least, he added with a slight doubt in his own voice, clearer than they are at the moment. He continued, I should warn you that the chamber we are about to pass into does not literally exist within our planet. It is a little too large. We are about to pass through a gateway into a vast tract of hyperspace. It may disturb you. Arthur made nervous noises. Slarty Bartfast touched a button and added, not entirely reassuringly, it scares the willies out of me. Hold tight. The car shot forward straight into the circle of light, and suddenly Arthur had a fairly clear idea of what infinity looked like. It wasn't infinity, in fact. Infinity itself looks flat and uninteresting. Looking up into the night sky is looking into infinity. Distance is incomprehensible and therefore meaningless. The chamber into which the car emerged was anything but infinite. It was just very, very, very big. So big that it gave the impression of infinity far better than infinity itself. Arthur's senses bobbed and span as travelling at the tremendous as, as travelling at the tr <laughs> travelling at the immense speed he knew the car had attained they climbed slowly through the open air leaving the gateway through which they had passed an invisible pinprick in the shimmering wall behind them the wall the wall defied the imagination seduced it and defeated it the wall was so paralyzingly vast and sheer that its top, bottom, and sides passed away beyond the reach of sight. The mere shock of vertigo could kill a man. The wall appeared perfectly flat. It would take the finest laser-measuring equipment to detect that as it climbed, apparently to infinity, as it dropped dizzily away, as it planed out to either side, it also curved. It met itself again thirteen light seconds away. In other words, the wall formed the inside of a hollow sphere. 
a sphere over three million miles across and flooded with unimaginable light. Welcome, said Slarty Bartfast, as the tiny speck that was the air car, travelling now at three times the speed of sound, crept imperceptibly forward into the mind-boggling space. Welcome, he said, to our factory floor. Arthur stared about him in a kind of wonderful horror. Ranged away before them at distances he could neither judge nor even guess at were a series of curious suspensions. Delicate traceries of metal and light hung about shadowy spherical shapes that hung in the space. This, said Slarty Bartfast, is where we make most of our planets, you see. You mean, said Arthur, trying to form the words, you, you mean you're starting it all up again now? No, no, good heavens, no, exclaimed the old man. No, the galaxy isn't nearly rich enough to support us yet. No, we've been awakened to perform just one extraordinary commission for very special clients from another dimension. It may interest you there, in the distance in front of us. Arthur followed the old man's finger till he was able to pick out the floating structure he was pointing out. It was indeed the only one of the many structures that betrayed any sign of activity about it. Though this was more a subliminal impression than anything one could put uh, anything one could put one's finger on. At that moment, however, a flash of light arced through the structure and revealed in stark relief the patterns that were formed on the dark sphere within. Patterns that Arthur knew. Rough, blobby shapes that were as familiar to him as the shapes of words, part of the furniture of his mind. For a few seconds he sat in stunned silence as the images rushed around his mind and tried to find somewhere to settle down and make sense. Part of his brain told him that he knew perfectly well what he was looking at and what the shapes represented, while another quite sensibly refused to countenance the idea and abdicated responsibility for any further thinking in that direction. The flash came again, and this time there could be no doubt. The Earth, whispered Arthur. Well, um, the Earth Mark II, in fact, said Slarty Bartfast cheerily. We're making a copy from our original blueprints. There was a pause. Are you, are you trying to tell me? said Arthur, slowly and with control, that you originally made the Earth. Oh, yes, said Slarty Bartfast. Uh, did you ever go to a place, um, I, I think it was called Norway? No, no, said Arthur, I didn't. Oh, pity, said Slarty Bartfast. That was one of mine. Won an award, you know. Lovely, crinkly edges. I was most upset to hear of its destruction. You were upset? Yes. Five minutes later and it wouldn't have mattered so much. It was a quite shocking cock-up. Huh? said Arthur. The mice were furious. The mice were furious? Oh, yes, said the old man mildly. Yes, well, I, I, so I expect with the dogs and cats and duckbill platypuses, but ah, but they hadn't paid for it, you see, had they? Look, said Arthur, would it save you a lot of time if I just gave up and went mad now? For a while, the air car flew on in awkward silence. Then the old man tried patiently to explain. Earthman. The planet you lived on was commissioned, paid for, and run by mice. It was destroyed five minutes before the completion of the purpose for which it was built, and we've got to build another one. 
only one word was registering with Arthur. Mice, he said. Indeed, Earthman. Look, sorry, are we talking about the little white furry things with the cheese fixation and women standing on tables screaming in early 60s sitcoms? Slarty Bartfast coughed politely. Earthman, he said, it is sometimes hard to follow your mode of speech. Remember, I have been asleep inside this planet of Magrathea for five million years, and know little of these early sixty sitcoms of which you speak. The creatures you call mice, you see, they are not quite as they appear. They are merely the protrusion into our dimension of vast, hyper-intelligent, pan-dimensional beings. The whole business with the cheese and the squeaking is just a front. The old man paused, and with a sympathetic frown, continued. Um, They've been experimenting on you, I'm afraid. Arthur thought about this for a moment, and then his face cleared. "'Aha, no,' he said. "'I see the source of the misunderstanding now. "'No, look, you see, what happened was "'that we used to do experiments on them. "'They were often used in behavioural research, "'Pavlov and all that sort of stuff. "'So what happened was that the mice would set "'what would be set all sorts of tests, "'learning to ring bells, run around mazes and things, "'so that the whole nature of the learning process "'could be examined.' From our observations of their behaviour, we were able to learn all sorts of things about our own. Arthur's voice tailed off. Such subtlety, said Slarty Bartfast. One has to admire it. What? said Arthur. How better to disguise their real natures, and how better to guide your thinking. Suddenly running down a maze the wrong way eating the wrong bit of cheese, unexpectedly dropping dead of mixomatosis. It's finely, finely calculated. The cumulative effect is enormous. He paused for effect. You see, Earthman, they really are particularly clever, hyper-intelligent, pan-dimensional beings. Your planet and people have formed the matrix of an organic computer running a ten million year research program. Let me tell you the whole story. It'll take a little time. Time, said Arthur weakly, is not currently one of my problems. Right. I think that's a good spot to finish. It is now coming up on 20 past 10. Um, Let's call it a day there. As I said, we are cracking on now. We've made a big chunk out of it, but uh, I think we are going to have to revisit this again next week. Um, if you're all in on that. If you are, um, please do drop me a message on the Bearded Whip page uh, and I'll set up some more times. Uh, but I'm proposing that we start again from... Uh, I, I need to take a break. I can tell you that. I've loved doing this, but it's... it's uh, Yeah, I need to do something else of an evening. Um, so um, much though I love um, being with you guys, I am going to take a break for a few days. But how about we come back and continue this Uh, on Sunday evening um, and then crack on into Easter week uh, and see if we can finish it. And then what I'm thinking, um, uh, once normality starts to get uh, um, established again in our world, um, that we can perhaps do this where I do readings um, of of the rest of the books on a Sunday evening going forwards. But let's let's see how we go from there. But let's get this one finished first uh, and um, I will resume um, on Sunday evening at uh, 9 p.m. European time, 8 p.m. UK time, and we'll take it on from there. But thank you very much once again for your company. I hope you're enjoying it. I am. Um, and uh, let's resume in a few days' time. Thanks very much, guys. Bye. <laughs>